Attempts to find a maritime route from Europe to India began many years before Vasco da Gama achieved the feat on behalf of the Portuguese crown in 1498. The discovery had a lasting economic impact in Europe, bringing down the long-term prices of pepper, cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, and other spices from the subcontinent that were in high demand for their use in food and medicine. The great age of exploration that was led by Portuguese and other European explorers ended centuries ago, but the age of mineral exploration is alive and well, and it has had a tremendous impact on our modern lives. One of the most important mineral discoveries of all time was that of Escondida in northern Chile's Atacama Desert region, today the world's largest copper mine. Escondida means hidden in Spanish, and like the route from Europe to India, many explorers tried and failed before a modern day Vasco da Gama, the legendary American geologist J. David Lowell, came along and uncovered it in 1981. Five different companies had held the exploration license to the property encompassing Escondida before a small team led by Lowell obtained the rights in the late 1970s. The Atacama Desert had been known for its abundance of copper and other metals for a long time, with indigenous people working the deposits in pre-Hispanic times to make weapons and tools, and mining companies extracting and exporting copper to Spain beginning in the 18th century. But problematically for the teams that explored the Escondida property in the 20th century, there was very little outcrop which is to say there was virtually no evidence of geological formations above ground and therefore little reason to believe there could be anything of value hiding underground. By the time Lowell arrived on the scene, he had accumulated more than two decades of experience in mineral exploration and had contributed to important discoveries in Arizona, British Columbia and the Philippines. He knew that almost all the big copper deposits in Chile and there are some absolute monsters among them fell in a narrow belt related to a continental scale structure and that they were all porphyry deposits, a term for large metal ore bodies formed from hot fluids originating in magma reservoirs several kilometers below the Earth's surface. This was useful information because it meant there was a strong possibility that other large deposits were hiding along the belt. The only question was precisely where. Lowell and his team drilled four other prospects before Escondida. The first was a reasonably sized mineral deposit that became the El Tesoro mine. The second, third and fourth revealed nothing. When Lowell finally arrived at Escondida, he observed that there were two hills that outcropped and that they exhibited the chemical alteration he was looking for, but were accompanied by what he called a weird leached surface texture. To further confuse matters, these rocks had high grades of molybdenum, but only very low traces of copper. Lowell recalled that a friend of his, Hans Langefeld, had studied geological features in the Atacama Desert a few years earlier and had noticed a strange phenomenon, that groundwater tended to move upward toward the Earth's surface rather than downward, as one would expect. The water would bring with it salt that removed the copper, but not the molybdenum, in the rocks, concealing any clues about copper mineralization underground. Eager to test the theory, Lowell and his team began drilling, and it only took four holes for them to realize they were onto something big. Two more years of drilling confirmed this was a massive mineral deposit, which Lowell eventually sold, along with an adjacent deposit, to a joint venture of two Chilean mining companies for the tidy sum of four and a half million dollars. Mining commenced at Escondida in 1990, and it is today operated by BHP, the world's largest mining company, in a joint venture with minority owners Rio Tinto, the world's second largest miner, and Japan's Jayco Corp. Escondida produces 1.2 million tons of copper per year on average at a value of almost $10 billion per year in current prices. This means it provides a full 5-6% to 6 of all the world's copper supply, and double that provided by the next largest copper mine, Colawasi, which is also in northern Chile. If you've made it this far, you may be wondering why any of this matters, beyond it being some long-winded way of teaching the importance of thinking outside the box. The answer begins with the fact that copper is used in a seriously wide range of applications, these include heating and air conditioning, consumer electronics and appliances, power generation, telecommunications, and industrial machinery and equipment, just to name a few. In fact, this reddish metal appears in so many of the things we consume that it has earned the nickname Dr. Copper, because knowing how much it is in demand gives one a PhD-like ability to gauge the health of the global economy. What's more, copper is a critical ingredient in a whole range of technologies used to reduce carbon emissions such as electric vehicle batteries, electricity grid expansion, wind and solar power generation, and battery storage. According to the International Energy Agency, up to 6 million tonnes per year of new copper supply, 
the equivalent of five Escondidas, will need to be sourced to meet possible demand from the electric vehicle and renewable energy sectors between now and 2030. This deficit could be bridged to some extent by expanding existing mines and increasing use of recycled copper. But new deposits will have to be discovered too, and quickly, given it can take up to 12 years and more than a billion dollars to develop a large copper mine. Copper prices surged to an all-time high of around $11,000 per tonne, or $5 per pound, in 2021 amid worries the supply deficit would arrive sooner than previously forecast. While prices have come down to a healthier level of around $8,000 to $9,000 since then, thanks largely to China's COVID lockdowns and worries of a global economic recession, the events of 2021 were an indicator of how fast prices could rise if not enough copper is discovered to meet the usual demand and support the so-called green energy transition. High prices are great for the shareholders of mining companies and for governments that collect royalties. And Chile, with around 27% of all global copper mine production, is the chief beneficiary. However, they aren't so great for the end users, which, given copper's use in so many different products, is, well, all of us. High prices for copper and other important metals have added to recent inflation woes. But just think how much worse the situation would be if David Lowell and his buddies hadn't gone around tapping rocks in the desert. There's a saying in the commodity markets that the cure for high prices is high prices. And in theory, if copper prices remain elevated, this will incentivize the mining sector to spend time and money looking for new deposits in the Atacama and other copper-rich jurisdictions, including Chile's neighbor Peru, as well as Mexico, Zambia, the DRC, southwestern United States, and various parts of Australia. But if there's any lesson from the Lowell story, it's that exploration is seriously difficult and the chances of finding another Escondida, let alone two half Escondidas or 10 one tenths of an Escondida, are pretty low. Chile, with 23% of the world's known copper reserves, is the prime candidate for the next big discovery. But the country is also representative of the headwinds facing the mining sector. Its new socialist government wants to impose a tax of up to 26% on the profits of mine operators, in addition to the median 39% tax on revenues currently paid by mining companies operating in the country. The local mining sector experiences frequent labour strikes and skill shortages. And then there is the increasing scrutiny of the sector's impact on the environment, and in particular, its water usage. Large copper deposits, as it happens, are often located in very dry places, and there is no drier place on earth outside of the two poles than the Atacama Desert. This means copper miners, who use 84 litres of water on average for every one kilogram of copper they produce, end up competing for scarce water resources with the indigenous people that inhabit the area, known as the Atacameño. According to some critics, the industry even competes with the Chilean people as a whole, who, the critics claim, pay the highest water tariffs in South America due to the privatization of Chile's water resources in the 1980s, which has allowed mining companies to bid up the price and secure more water for themselves. Desalination has gone some way to addressing what academics have labeled a hydrosocial conflict, with BHP spending $3.4 billion on a plant and pipelines to transport water from the Chilean coast all the way up to Escondida, which sits 3,200 meters above sea level, and several other minor operators in the country embarking on similar projects to either desalinate or recycle water. Some experts have called for the industry to invest heavily in developing better mineral processing technologies to extract more copper from each tonne of ore they dig up. If achieved, this will reduce the amount of mining needed to meet copper demand, and that will have the effect of decreasing the sector's water consumption and reducing the need for new mines. But this won't be enough to fill the demand supply gap in its entirety, and the world will still need more copper mines, even if it's the equivalent of, say, two or three Escondidas, and not five as in the most extreme scenario. The good news for the energy transition is that if prices stay high enough for long enough, then the incentives to head out and explore for more copper will outweigh all the disincentives. And with a little out-of-the-box thinking, someone might just discover Escondida numero dos. The only question is precisely where. I'm your host Nadav for Mining the World. If you learned something new, interesting and valuable from this video and would like to see more, please hit the subscribe button and ever you are in this mineral-rich world of ours, 